Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Influential You podcast. My name is Josh D'Amigo, and I'm an Influential You consultant, senior program faculty member, and your host for this podcast. At Influential You, we teach you how to launch, grow, and scale your business and amplify your influence. Since 2009, we've helped thousands of business owners, executives, and entrepreneurs become more influential, more rewarded, and more you. Over the last 10 years of this podcast, we have built a collection of stories from individuals who found satisfaction through our advanced education and shared their stories through interviews. This season, we'll revisit some of these classic tales. We'll share original episodes of the Influential You podcast hosted by our CEO and co-founder, John Patterson, and I'll share some of the key takeaways that I learned from listening to each of the interviews. Today, we'll revisit our interview with Influential You clients, the Brothers Corin. Released in December of 2016, this episode features John's interview with Isaac and Thorold Corin. You may recognize their band as The Kin. In their interview, you'll hear that not having an aim for their careers worked for a while, but in the long run, they weren't able to achieve what they believed they could have. Like the great quote from Brian Tracy, if you don't set goals for yourself, you are doomed to achieve the goals of someone else. You'll learn more in this episode. During this podcast episode, you'll hear references to Influence Ecology, the original name for our organization, which is another way of saying you are the company you keep, and that is still a big part of what we teach our clients and teams today. Enjoy this episode, and I'll see you on the other side. Today's feature is an interview with recording artists Isaac and Tarald Corin from The Kin. The Kin band got everything they asked for, record labels, international notoriety, playing big arenas. They toured with Coldplay, Pink, Bon Jovi, Rod Stewart, but they hadn't quantified what to wish for or how to transact for it, naively assuming their talent, passion, and fame would eventuate into their personal and financial satisfaction. They confronted a sea of indifference and inventoried their lessons to help others. They launched the Alchemy of Creative Expression, or ACE, developing a method to help the talented musician, artist, or executive unleash their unique voice and turn their talent into gold. In our Guru Talk, we'll hear co-founder Kirkland Tibbles address the importance of both knowing your aims and transacting accordingly. Here's the interview. So the first thing I want to do is welcome the both of you here. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Love you both to death. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Take a moment and introduce yourselves. I'm Tarl Corin. I'm Isaac Corin, and we are the Brothers Corin. <laughs> we've never said that like that. We have that never good. said that, haven't we? We became friends and uh, members of Influence Ecology around two years ago, or almost. And um, in that period of time, we've morphed and shaped and shifted and evolved thanks to this ecology in, in, in huge ways. Great. Give us a sense of who you are, your your journey, if you would, please. Here's what I know. I met Isaac. I met your father-in-law through Influence Ecology. He's been studying with us for quite some time. He says something about your band. I go, I don't know who that is. He says, oh, well, let me see if I can play something. He plays me a clip from a late night talk show right? And suddenly I'm thinking, who the hell are these guys? I meet you. I fall in love with a song. You've never yet to play me, by the way. I fall in love with a song and the rest is history. I've come to know your talent. We've participated in each other's lives in a lot of ways, but give us a sense of, if you will, your journey from Australia to here we are now, right here in Ojai. Well, Isaac likes to say we stowed away on a cargo ship. Uh, We put that in our first bio, but as you know, That's probably not what happened. There was planes. (laughs) And uh, we both arrived on the shores of the United States two years apart following our fabulous mother who's in the midst of a midlife crisis, uh, we think, and wanted to come back to the theater in New York. And we both had an opportunity to move from a small city in Australia to uh, the big smoke, New York City. And we met again together. We got into music separately. We opened our mouths and sung harmonies for the first time as teenagers and went, well, we can't not do this. And we've been cohorts and partners in crime 
and not just brothers, but obviously always brothers uh, since. We're almost 19 years in various business together. Yeah, the kin, the kin took, took us on a wild journey from New York City, and then we got picked up by uh, Universal and went on tour with Pink and Coldplay and Rod Stewart. And we estimate it's, we've played to over a million people now, and we both had kids and moved to LA to really, we'd done our 10,000 hours or more on performing and we realized that our, possibly our weak link was in the mysterious art of writing a song and, and also working in the studio to capture that energy. What is it that in a live show, when people are in front of you, what is it that either can or cannot be captured in the mirror of the microphone. And so we've really set ourselves out to two and a half years now uh, in the running to study the invention, the performance, the production, and the assessment cycle of music. And it's led us to this process that we've kind of boiled down to about nine weeks now that kind of takes you through a hero's journey, if you wish, of discovering creativity and expression and lands in the execution and assessment of of any creative goal we feel so we're still testing that model but we're excited to be where we are and our our studies with transactionalism and influence ecology and just everyone's input and uh, especially working directly in groups with with actual other participants in the course has really shaped our awareness of in particular building teams and realizing that you just cannot do anything alone. And so I would say our, my greatest criticism of, of our past actions were that we always thought we could do it alone. We had each other and yet we didn't know how to go past that. And so now we've been with this new technology, we've, we've been working with others a lot better and, and building small teams and really honing back towards what it is at the heart of everything Tarot and I do together, which is our uh, synergy as two people that is kind of beyond brothers, really. But we like to call it the Brothers Corin now because it kind of makes us feel like we haven't too many things on the boiler, even though <laughs> that's always, it's always possible. So really, we landed in Ojai with, with the, uh, the desire to learn more about what we're actually doing. And it's taken us this far and we're now offering it to others. So it's been exciting. You snickered, Tarl, just a little bit about getting the help of other people. Did I? Did I? I was just probably smiling at, at, at the, just thinking about me admitting it. Looking, <laughs> looking at uh, no, I, you, there's just so many. Yeah, there's so much. Isaac and I, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, stepped into the music business uh, when we were teenagers in New York. I looked at Isaac and said, how serious are you? He was like, deadly. And I was like, cool, well, I guess success is just, you know, around the corner. Like, we're a week away. And we so we just stepped in, you know, with all this inspiration and grit and the clarity boys. and like and all, if anything kind of <laughs> some some australian you know like naivete, naivete <laughs> entitlement not mean entitlement just like believe it and it shall be yeah so a lot of that a lot of um conviction and blood sweat and tears and and loving that and the drama of it everything you need to get halfway through <laughs> yeah. and it's amazing what we did accomplish with that with that grit and you can move things but years later you know, we looked around and saw the the paths we blazed and burned and and dug ditches and and all of these little parts of naivete where you where you just go wild and hope for the best. And uh, when we finally came out of our major label experience and all the touring and we had got to the arenas supporting someone, it didn't look like the success we had dreamed of with the Ken. But there was a lot of movement and a lot of stuff that our, our goals or our aims had never been reached. And so it was a really interesting feeling because there was celebration of us, yet the aims weren't there. I definitely want to talk about that for a second because looking in, you play stadiums, you, uh, like I said, the first time I heard of you, you had opened for Pink. That to me is a certain level of success, satisfaction, fulfillment, and so forth. And like any endeavor, I don't care what it is. Uh, I don't care if you start a new business or you, you launch a family or you get married. There's always, you know, how you imagine it. And then there's the reality of it, right? And the reality of it, then what did you discover about what you'd missed? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, and thanks for 
clarifying uh, the question too, because we actually did get everything we asked for. And I think what we learned is in the goal setting, we weren't careful what we wished for. <laughs> because we did wish to sign a major label deal and we did wish to tour arenas and we wished that we'd form a band that was musically very synergistic and powerful and, and we found that in Shake Leg, our third member. And so we did get a lot of the things we asked for. They just didn't, the experience of them and the reality, as you said, wasn't exactly what we thought it would be. So I think part part of it is is not having the, the specific goal written down and, and a measurable, the measurements. And you're shaking your head at the measurement. Well, we didn't know how to measure the success. Our expectations uh, weren't necessarily measurable like we thought they would be. And fair to say, it's the music industry. And you know, it's a great study of what pie in the sky, big, lofty aims look like and, and it, without necessarily any path or measurement not much strategy or logic about how to get somewhere. It's completely subjectual. Is it like chasing an experience? In a lot of ways, it's like chasing an experience and no one can really tell you how to do it. And as you meet, you know, Isaac and I, as we went further and further and started to meet people at the top, we realized no one knew the answer, right. how they got there or how to be there. So measuring something and, and being deliberate and practicing deliberately is not generally a language. And not only that, but what's celebrated in the music industry is that apathy, is that I'm not really listening, looking at you, typing on my iPhone. It is this well. indifference is celebrated. Like I'm, I'm above it, I can be aloof to you or so something like that. Is that what you mean? Sure. And I mean, I think it's a, it's a protection from notoriety and the, the negative effects of fame. Okay. Um, but it just comes with the territory of the music business, so it's not. You know, it's a different culture in, tra in in the transaction. Yeah, I think Isaac and I, as we were going through it, we asked people in the music industry in our ecology, okay, how do we do this? Yeah, I know we're doing this, but how do we do this? And there was never a clear path in in, in an industry like the music business. So as we, we, I guess when we came out of the Kins wave, we realized that we had been naive, that we had hoped someone would give us this answer of like, oh, finally you're here. This is what you do, X, Y, Z. We were waiting for someone without leaving space really to create a team that could show us maybe what we're missing or where we're being naive. And that's the thing that you were waiting for was some answers to what you didn't know or what you thought you might be naive about. Absolutely. Taking up the space for that person to come in and be valuable. Right. We've accelerated this learning process since working uh, with Influence Ecology, but um, we've we've started working with producers and empowering our judge on the team, and um, and really knowing our place in the team and knowing where to get out of the way, knowing how to fully put something in someone's hands, and so we've started working with people and really empowering them in in helping us move and respond properly to, to offers and making offers properly. And we've also created, like, like Todd said, we've created this process that, that offers an, a young artist what we didn't ever have. And so we're kind of offering that thing that we just wish we had at 20, you know, but we didn't. And that was our path. And we had to make all of those mistakes. And not one of them was out of place and, and mistimed. And however, that's not necessarily what everyone else has to do. And so we don't, we don't recommend our mistakes. We recommend that you learn from them, but don't make them. Talent is not everything clearly. And, and so we've always rested on our talent and we've never really broken out of that perspective. Um, and thought, well, what could we be doing a lot better? Or, and who can we ha have help us see what we don't see and move in timing that, that we're not good at because we're too lost in the moment of what we're creating. So, yeah. So that's been, that's been really fun to, to wake up and realize all, you know, all of the reasons and some of the reasons, not all of them. We're still learning clearly, but 
it's been it's been fun offering uh, the the return on our mistakes to others. Mm, that's well said. I'd I'd love to take my hand at explaining that one more time because um, it's such a such a juicy subject. Being artists in the music business is such a fun study for influence ecology. Now we've been a part of the education of influence ecology. It's it's so easy and clear to see how people transact and how people interact and how people don't move powerfully and particularly just in it in ourselves and so done in such with such good nature and with good intention and we just thought well if we just keep pushing it will find the doors and we did find doors the last few years of touring with the ken we we did everything in our power that we knew how to we were missing clarity and accurate thinking on what to do and what to decline, what to counter, uh, what to risk, to really focus on and measure and see and trust ourselves to make the kind of choices that bring those people that are really going to help close and really set free and clear off the plate those that are um, just fodder and, and, and gray zone. And so in hindsight, it's like all of a sudden we realized that we had not taken our talent and necessarily specialized it mm. we had we had just provided what we thought was well what, let's say yes to everything and with our talent and with our relationship ability we'll go out into the world we'll transact we'll find opportunities it got us to a certain place but not to our aims we will be right back with the rest of the brothers corin story but first a reminder that the influential you podcast is brought to you by thrive Influential Use Self-Guided Training. Thrive is a professional self-development program that lets you learn at your own pace. Thrive members enjoy weekly live e-coaching sessions and an ever-expanding library of exclusive video lessons taught by our faculty, consultants, and industry experts. Sign up today and use promo code 30DAYS to get a Thrive Self-Guided Training subscription free for 30 days. That's coupon code 30 D-A-Y-S. For links or to find out more, you can click the link in the show notes for this podcast or in the USA or Canada, you can text the word THRIVE to 805-262-9008 and we'll send you the registration link right to your mobile phone. Again, text the word THRIVE to 805-262-9008. You can cancel at any time. Back to the interview. What is it that you in your mind was missing or flawed that you're now providing people? Well, the goals we had as the kin were really unbounded goals. And so when we envisioned playing an arena, we just assumed that those people were there for us in our vision. We did play the arena, but they were there for Pink and Coldplay, but we, we played them as though they were there for us. So we really made that count. When we signed to a major label and everything was was amazing, you know, being signed by Jimmy Iovine and, you know, everyone was at our showcase and it was just a phenomenal moment in time. And then the reality of signing to a major label was very different and it's it's an old story. I'd say 95% of artists that do sign to a major label have that story of they weren't that one thing out of 10 that that did anything this quarter. And so as an artist, you really have to come up against the corporate structure there and where art and commerce meet. And so we were naive to that world because it was our first time through. And so we didn't understand their indifference to us because it had taken every ounce of of our passion to get to their front door and to see their indifference to some extent. For example, when we showed up in Perth to play with Pink and questioned why they hadn't printed any CDs to sell at the arena, there was no response to the question. So we were disappointed. Did you take that the indifference personally? We did. We didn't understand how to take it because there was, you know, we took took it personally because what we were putting on the table was our hearts on our sleeves. And it wasn't, I think we, we found the opportunity, um, through, through other connections to open for pink and, uh, through them loving us so much, they gave us another 20 dates and, and we'd done everything we could to be recognized, um, by 
the people we're in business with, and it and it was a it was a pass in the end, political many other reasons, but it was a pass nonetheless. To move through that, we have to also take responsibility for you know, what were we missing, what we, and so the, we realized that there's just there's so many factors to where we were in that in that moment, um, and I think what we what we didn't have our aim, like Isaac said, our aim was this big lofty we'll do anything to get to this place we've really not even said much about. It's just this place. And I think it's ultimately a beautiful American dream and I and and I love them with true American immigrants. And our idea was like, we're just gonna go there. And like if we ever talked about it, it would change and shift and shape. Mm-hmm. And it was just all it was all loft. What we didn't have in place was aims that actually made sense. Like let's by in three years, let's play to eighteen hundred people in these markets. Now, what are the steps? What's the actions? What's the work and action? How do we measure? What would what could we do to possibly produce that result? And then we we never got to that. If we did, it was for maybe five days, and we would fall back into the allure of of how everyone else in our ecology was acting, which was like or positivity and then you get your shot or you don't get your shot and it's it's just completely up in the air. I think we got disappointed but then re-enlivened by realizing that our naivete was our responsibility. And as we stepped out of that experience, we we've completely recalibrated and completely specialized and we we didn't force the speciality. We've taken our time. We just finally feel like we're at the doorstep of our next chapter which is taking all of that good stuff and specializing and making it valuable as an offer of help in the world. The first thing I want to say is, is my experience of you in watching you perform just recently, or even the first time I saw you perform at one of our conferences, is how much you love the experience of an intimate group of people, how much you love the experience of the connection that comes when you're participating with others and some expression of some kind. And as I've watched you perform and thought about that and thought about the condition of life we call work, it had me cock my head a couple of times and think, these guys are probably going to begin to really confront what they enjoy doing on a day-to-day basis in ways maybe they had. Like, what do you like to do? What do you want to do? There's what you do to fulfill the big dream whatever that may be, but it may not be what you want to do day to day, moment to moment and the like. And then the other piece of that is, and you pointed to this a little bit ago, Tarled, when you said, you know, we, we didn't really ask ourselves, what do we want? And you both are the nicest, sweetest, big hearted, most loving people I think I've ever met, which is shocking to me for couple of people who have met such indifference, <laughs> right? But I've often been concerned for that you take care of yourself in terms of work and you take care of yourself in terms of money. And yet, as I hear you talk about farm and where you're headed in Corn Brothers, and, and all, it sounds like that's where you're headed and I couldn't be happier. So let's talk a little bit about that and your next chapter and, and what you're up to. Thank you, John. We started our new chapter as farm artists a month before we met you and met Influence Ecology. We came up with this idea as we were driving to a writing session in LA, and Isaac and I got into a great conversation about what we hadn't had as young artists to develop a sound and specialize it in the world, to know how to tell our story and know how that fits in the marketplace. And we, through what we'd done previously with others, non-professionally, we'd always come around people and wanted to write their song and help them express themselves and help them create. We teamed up everything we'd done with our coaching experience and everything. We came up with this idea, let's create a a process to take someone from inception to celebration of a musical work in the world. Short way of saying, let's help someone become an artist for the first time, a musical artist. And uh, we had our first client in three weeks after we came up with the idea in, on this car ride. She flew in and somehow, like with any great idea, we had the process. It was already there. We knew that it was this profile and this piece and 
this part and this is how we'd invent these ideas and show that to them and and how we'd co-create a story, a sound, a narrative and a whole piece for this artist that they'd always dreamed of creating and never had the big brothers to do it with. And we effortlessly got them to completion and celebrated it and then we turned around and went, we have a process here. And it just wrote itself just like Abraham or Mary or some of our songs that we really don't feel responsible for. We just could put ourselves in the way of, of it coming through us. Uh, farm artists was the same. And now we're a little over 20 artists complete and celebrated, a um, bunch of referrals later. It's not even a two-year-old company. And Isaac and I have been refining the process. And about a year ago, we looked at each other and said, oh, this process is not just for music. This is for anyone with any creative work that wants to come along this journey, this alchemical journey that we've, we're putting together. So it just, it birthed a whole new chapter for us. Yeah. I'll have to say that um, our studies with Influence Ecology have, have allowed Tarald and I to enhance our partnership because we are different. We've kind of focused on our different specializations. So we've now kind of broken our process up with farm artists so that we don't actually work all the time together. And so it allows us to kind of double our productivity and maybe even more than that because we're really allowing each other the space to thrive in our own specialized skill. And before we were kind of competing for that same space a little bit intrinsically, now we have this kind of real appreciation for what the other brings and really leans on that strength that they have. and. I think the new level for us. And so it's going to be interesting to see where that grows and how we can offer that to people. And also uh, with the process, we've made sure that we have other strengths, other people are supporting these artists in ways that we know we can't. So being really clear with ourselves now, what we can't offer people and knowing what pieces to bring in to the team so that people can rely on our process. Yeah. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you and Influence Ecology for that piece, to understand what personality you are, who you are in current business with, who you're in current business with that's not working, and where you're weakest. Being a performer myself, the study of people has always been my, my greatest talent, my greatest love. And just to really see how personalities work together and don't work together uh, and what works and what doesn't work has just been priceless, actually. How Isaac and I have been able to really s get to see who we are and who we were being that wasn't working and bring in new ways that are working. It's just phenomenal. So Isaac's an inventor for sure. I'm a performer. I lean inventor. I believe Isaac leans performer. So we lean into each other. And as we got clear on that and crystallized that, we looked over and went, oh, Okay, we've we've not let our judges actually assess anything, even though we've got all of them around us. And we've always scared off all producers because we come on strong and then don't let them do any control. Right? <laughs> and so we had this amazing breakthrough. We were like, Oh, that's us. This is us. We always had this like um, we always um, thought um, we had a story like, No, we never get the right help. That we'd never been we'd never left the space for the right help. Huge breakthrough for us. Looks like you recognize yourself in that a lot. Yeah. Anything you want to say about that? I mean, he's saying it well. Yeah. Just never being, never, never really putting in micromanaging. It's the inventor's disease, by the way. I mean, I'm, I am guilty. We both did it, you know, and um, him on details and logistics and me on, on uh, who knows why. <laughs> I know this is a but, podcast, but if I could make a visual of holding everything while saying, why haven't this, why hasn't this been done? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's you kind never of, sent the email. You know, <laughs> and, and just so much of that. And also I'd like a big part for me was to really understand how to be with the judge personality. And that that's actually something I love. Yeah. Your wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From my partner to our manager, just an amazing realization that, that um, you have to let that person assess and have have a real stake and just just the breakthroughs when you allow your team to be a team and then the power of really seeing who you're missing and know how to find that person and invite them in and satisfy their conditions satisfy their personality condition 
So it's just been fundamentally important as we've built you know, our new office in the world. I think transactional competence is a, it's a f- human phenomenon. It's one of the reasons that people from executive or an artist or a somebody that's unemployed to somebody that's going after it with everything they got, it's all transactional competence. There's so many lessons of where we're naive and, and what we didn't see and how come we didn't see it and all of that. I was listening a little bit earlier to the way you were talking about your having met indifference. And you spoke about it from, I would imagine, artist's point of view. Like um, I've, I'm expressing myself and putting my heart out there and there's all this indifference. And I thought to myself, yeah, but I'm doing the same thing. As a business owner, my heart, my soul is in this thing every day. Every bit of my, every ounce of me is in this. And so as a person who's launching an enterprise, whatever it is, whether or not it's a band or a widget, people put all their passion into these things and they're met with such indifference. It's one of the reasons I love being able to teach this is because everyone Everyone gets up every morning to transact to satisfy their aims and everybody's met with a sea of indifference, just a complete sea of indifference. And you got to feed your kids. You got to you got to take care of your aims. You got to live the life you want. You got to learn how to influence people so that it can turn out the way that you hope and imagine, not just for you, but for all the people involved in in whatever endeavor. One of the things we used to teach early on, and I don't think we ever said it in one of your programs that, that I remember because we stopped saying it, but I may bring it back. We used to train people and say, you know how on that airplane they tell you to put your own mask on first before you can put it on other people? Oftentimes what we find missing with people in the transactions in which they're engaged is that it, they put the mask on first. They're happy to put it on other people. They're happy to take care of other people. They're happy to go for it. I'll be fine. I'll have it turn out for me. Don't worry. Eventually, I'll land on my feet. And all the while, the plane is going down and still the mask is not yet on your face, (laughs) right? So just with that analogy, anything else to say about your own journey and how you've now put the mask on your own face? Yeah, I think at the end of the the kin run and getting off the major label, we realized that because we took the indifference personally, we didn't look and say, oh, that's just the current. And that's, we, we hadn't fully studied the current. We were so focused on ourselves. We didn't ever reach out to that indifferent place and study them and find any of those details that could reflect us so that there could be some kind of synergy with the current. We just assumed that they would catch us and catch up or keep up with us. And so since then, we've been, we've been studying the current for the sake of ourselves and also others. And it's definitely, there's a science to it. And there's like a lot of people are making it up. Most people don't know what they're doing. And I'd say everyone doesn't know what they're doing, but it's, it's a lot of that language of indifference that we've kind of learned to see through and try and cut through in, in our transactions while knowing more about the current. So we figured as long as the mask for us was we have to know the current in order to play amongst the current and to transact with it, but never be the current fully, like always standing out and finding that, that individuality while being uh, relatable to the current. So there's a dance there. And, and so we're, we're still learning that. Can't say the mask is fully on yet. But yeah, it's, it's certainly been a wake up call to say the least. I don't know what you want to say about it. Well, I would say for us, putting the mask on was, was moving from artists in the world, playing a big game, hoping the success would catch us, moving from that to thinking accurately and saying, well, what is our money aims? What do we want to make? What's actually our base aim? What do we need to spend per month to be level one? Okay, and then what does level two money aim look like? What does level three money aim look like? And I think as we started to do that, we started to think accurately about satisfying our conditions in a way that was not just in our grasp, but accurate and real. And what I, I got to sort of see a part of me that had actually never had, I'd never had a money aim ever. I'd had a success aim. I'd had a 
an aim for right. yeah an aim for this this thing and i could put words on it and i could say it's this there was no pathway necessarily um i certainly didn't have a money aim and potential work and action that could produce that result and so isaac and i started a meeting we call money work career meeting we use all of the principles of money work career and we measure each aim we measure the actions that we've committed to we use percentages to see where we are with that money aim against each month. So we know three months ahead if we're at 19% of that money aim. And it's been hugely helpful. And I would say, you know, when you say put, your ma- put the mask on yourself, it's single-handedly taken us from hoping we pay rent years ago to having a structure and a strategy of expansion, of moving here, of taking on bigger houses that we're renting and, and looking at office spaces and making plans into next year and taking breaks. You just spent five weeks. Uh, we took a five-week summer break that was ended in a show. However, we've never taken a summer off since we were kids. So there's been a tremendous amount of little successes and it's fun to celebrate them whilst knowing we're nowhere near uh, bigger money metrics, but we've consistently for one year hit our base money metric. I can't tell you how exciting and, and how successful of a foundational thing that is for two brothers that floated in the lofts so it's been really amazing that's the mask on uh to me this last two years that's great well it makes me happy because i mean the only thing i ever watch you do is want to contribute to people and you can't when the mask is not on yet so that's great i want to give you an opportunity to just say anything you'd like to say whether or not it's a soapbox a a bitch, a complaint, a, a lesson or giveaway or something you want to leave people with, anything else that you'd like to say? Just gratitude for, for what you guys have created. It's been the most powerful study I've been a part of that has led to just specific help, particularly in, in seeing myself as someone who has a speciality to offer in the world, then to be able to, to look around and see who's on my team that is that complementary speciality and who are we missing and what is our offer and where is it in the marketplace and what is our value and how much should we charge and how much do we trade for and and the power of decline the power of that's not your right customer just how much fat that's cut off from our day-to-day experience not only that but how how much that's sharpened our vision it's like putting on like a great pair of glasses and everything's crystallized and you suddenly just start to learn that what humans do intuitively is not necessarily intuitive at all that um, we have to often use counterintuitive moves especially when it comes to our biology and especially because we've taught each other in the current to be a certain way, to be indifferent, to be in, to be naive, to to just want you know put things on credit card, to you know have it now, all of these things. To act powerfully, you have to override certain things, and and that's what I really coach when it comes to behavior and a new relationship to the brain as a human being. And what I've come to as someone who has walked through obsessive compulsive disorder is one must not believe their biology. One must go beyond and override that first level of biology to really be themselves. And things are uncomfortable. It, it hurts to dare to suck. It hurts to specialize. It hurts to say mm, we're being naive there. It, it's not, that's not a comfortable, fun, positive movement. That is a real, accurate, one step at a time way of being. So I, I'm very grateful to Influence Ecology for that. Yeah, I would like to echo that same uh, gratitude. and. My my offer has specialized into really getting to know myself as an inventor and what is the potential. F- if I can know myself, you know, know thyself and really just get to know, do all of the shadow work, know all of the light, know all of the dark, or ask all of the questions that not even my best friends for, will ask of myself and really get all of the creative data up on the board, all of it. I want to see all of it shine the light on everywhere, every little thing that you don't say during the normal day. Get it all up on the board and then use a process that can filter 
and transform and to distill and to find those those elements or those those creative impulses that have gravity and can resonate in the world you know so it's a it's a process of knowing thyself and so that's what i what i learned in influence ecology and now that's my specialization is is to help others see that they're a gold mine something truly marvelous and magical so thank you i accept all right well this has been a pleasure thank you so very very much i'm glad to now have you both in our hometown as i said today in our talk we'll listen in on a webinar to hear co-founder kirkland tibbles address the importance of thinking accurately about and knowing your aims in each condition of life and how to transact for them here's the talk what is your aim and in what condition of life are we addressing what is your aim if you do the proper work to accurate thinking and the deliberate practice that it takes to study, work through, get help, ask for help in the articulation of aims, you're going to be in great shape as you work your way through the rest of this program. And I'll even be a little dramatic and say the rest of your life. What is your aim? What is it that will do? What will satisfy you in the most important areas of your life? And if you're if, if you're able to clearly articulate to the best of your ability right now where you are in the current situation, where you find yourself, where you've located yourself, if you can articulate your aim, you're in great shape to begin the next round, to begin to determine what it is going to take in terms of resources for you to move to the next level. So uh, you won't do any more important work than in step one. And if you're doing it right, you will constantly be addressing the ever-changing dynamic that is existing and transacting in this environment we call life. On a day-to-day -day basis, in the push and pull of our environments, things change. In the push and pull of our environment, we get invitations, offers, requests all the time. And the thing to refer to is the aim you have in that condition of life. When, I, when I'm working with someone, that's generally the first place we'll, we'll go to. What what condition of life are we talking about here when someone is working on a transaction? What is it that you need to satisfy? Step number one, I'll give you an example. It is, it is an aim for low-cost transactions that has us put up a slide reminding you time after time after time, whether it's a webinar or whether it's a live event, the small little commitments that we have with each other to keep the promises, things like the proprietary documents and sharing material and being responsible for what you share. That tactic that we use every single time we start a program is in direct correlation to an aim we have to produce an effective environment, to produce money for us and for you and so forth. It, it goes all the way back to tactics that we utilize are correlated to some specific aim that we have for our work. We do not want to work really hard to chase you down for study papers. So we remind you all the time, don't get behind. And if you're going to see that you're going to get behind, be in communication with us. That's from an, an aim that we have to train you in the condition of life work, the actual activity of this program, the activity that we have to engage in on a regular basis with the hundreds of folks that are studying with us that are turning in metrics and papers. So I, Everything relates back to and always comes back to your aims. And I don't think there's any advanced person on this call who will tell you that it, it always goes back always to what is your aim and your aims will be changing. They will be, your aims will be altering. You will suddenly find yourself with resources available to you that will allow you to expand your aims. You'll find that you're in transactions that are simply not going to deliver the goods for you in some conditions. Well, the only way you're going to know that is to do the deliberate and hard work of clearly articulating, as you see them right now, your aims. And things are going to happen. Stuff happens out there. People get pregnant. People get sick. Bosses walk off the job. I just had a project where an actor just left the project, and now we're stuck. We're not going to change the aim of getting the project done. But what we've got to do now is we've got to go to work. We've got to, we've got to alter the work and action required to fulfill on that because we clearly know what our aims are. We know where to go.
because we know what our aims are, we know what our budget has to be, because we know what our aims are, the kind of work we want to do, and so forth. The first thing to do is to be clear about your aims. And the questions that I ask when I'm looking at any transaction, large or small, and I'm looking to, to move in a transaction, the first place I typically go is, will it support my other conditions of life? If I take on a new project, is it going to affect my health adversely? Am I going to have to log in a whole bunch of extra hours? Is it, is it actually asking of me something that will have me alter things like travel and sleep? Will I be able to get in the exercise that I need to get in if I take on this project and it has me travel, for example? Will it support or harm my current health aims? Is it against the ethics that I have for that particular condition of life? Well, that, that, that actually requires me to have to stop for a second and say, what are my ethics for health? What are the principles that I am going to adhere to the activities required to take on this project or to accept this invitation, is it going to be good for me in terms of my health? I might ask, does this particular invitation that I'm receiving and this offer that I may accept, is it based on something that suits my skills, my personality, my ability? Will it, will it adhere to my aims for the kind of work that I want to do? Is there important questions to ask? If I'm taking on a project and I look at that project, is it going to require capital? Is it going to require money for me to be involved? Will it adversely affect the money that I am already producing in income or capital at work? What's my aim for money? Is this, is this particular transaction going to produce the kind of money that I need and support my aims for money? And if it's risky, how is that going to affect my other conditions of life? Will it affect my identity in the marketplace to take on this particular project? Is it going to adversely affect my public identity in some way to be known to be involved in that project? Does it support or help the activities of influence ecology? Does it support or help the identity that I want to produce in the marketplace? And on and on. I work all the way up into the higher transactional conditions of life because I'm concerned about things like the environment. I'm concerned about my legacy. And those things have emerged as important conditions of life for me. How is it going to impact my ability to function among others? And on and on. There, there is no more important work that you will do than step one. And if you study with us for very long and you and I engage in advanced programs, chances are you're going to hear this come out of my mouth on a regular basis. Gosh, what's your aim and in what condition of life? If you'd like to know more about us, you can go to influentialu.global and explore our courses, consulting, and conferences. We offer a four-year curriculum for those seeking an advanced experience. However, if you're brand new to Influential U, we recommend that you start with Thrive. It's our self-guided training. Thrive is a self-guided program that lets you learn at your own pace. Thrive members enjoy weekly live e-coaching sessions and an ever-expanding library of exclusive video lessons with our faculty, thought leaders, and industry experts. You'll get proven proprietary tools to accurately assess your career and develop a realistic strategy to achieve your aims faster. Your membership also includes chat access to faculty, plus discounts to our transformative conferences. Sign up today and use promo code 30DAYS for a free 30-day test drive of Influential Use Thrive Program. That code, 30DAYS, and you may cancel at any time. Thank you so much for listening today. You'll find new episodes on our website, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, so you may easily share this podcast with others. You can also subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or any place that you listen to quality podcasts. Next week on the Influential You podcast, we interview Joe McNearney and what he learned about how his skepticism was actually a good thing. Now he was able to harness it to increase his value. We hope you'll join us. You may check our show notes for links to connect with our guests plus links to websites, books, or special downloads that we may have mentioned in today's episode. This season's podcasts were made possible by the Influential You staff, 
faculty, and our members all around the world. With a special thanks to our executive producer, Tyson Crandall, Joey Anderley, our in-studio producer, thank you, Joey, with contributions from John Patterson, Michael Teehee, Daryl Anderley, Paul West, and Liz Smiley. With a special thanks to our guests, the Brothers Corn. The Influential You podcast is produced in Ventura, California. This episode was originally recorded in December of 2016. The podcast theme is by Chris Standring, entitled Fast Train to Everywhere. And if you haven't yet offered a rating or review, I ask that you take a moment, go to your iTunes or podcast app and let us know what you think. This helps us more than you know. We'll see you next time on the Influential You podcast.